am Chantilly Jagannath. I'm here to present on design secrets for a non-designer. So a little bit about myself. I am the Vice President of Data Visualization and Training at Lovelytics, which is a data consulting company based out of Arlington, Virginia. We are Tableau Partners, Altrix Partners, Snowflake Partners, uh, Mapbox Partners as well. I'm also the founder and CEO of Millennials in Data, a nonprofit organization that works to bridge the data literacy gap among millennials by providing them with various trainings and, and workshops. I'm also a two-time Tableau Zen master, but most importantly, I am not a designer. So let me tell you all why I'm not a designer. Let's look back at my journey. So my non-designer journey began at Howard University about 10 years ago. I was presented with a an Excel spreadsheet, or really just a data set that couldn't be opened in Excel. And our professor said, make sense of this data. And at that point in my college journey, the only tool that we knew how to use was Excel. This data set had a million plus records. So every time that I tried to open this data set up, it crashed my computer over and over again. So one night I simply just went to Google search what can analyze data and I downloaded Tableau because it was free for students at the time and I created this visualization. And this was the visualization that I presented in class the, the, the following day. And as you can see, I didn't even bother to take off the sheet four off of my header. So these were my first visualizations that I've ever created. Whereas today I'm able to create visualizations that you see here on the screen. Things like the TEDx example, the Myers-Briggs Foundation, the Sydney Ferry uh, interactive map. I'm also able to create visualizations like that. So what I'm going to walk you all through today is how I went from the visualization that you see on the left-hand side to the visualization that you see on the right-hand side with zero formal designer training. So what are the secrets? The secrets are, first, understand your requirements. So we're gonna talk about gathering requirements. Two, you wanna make sure that you're able to create a template. Three, you wanna use icons and art to your advantage. Four, you wanna choose colors that matter. And then five, you wanna use uh, fonts strategically. So let's dive into gathering requirements. So the first thing to gather in requirements is that you want to make sure you understand the overall goal of the project. Second, you want to determine your audience's analytical maturity. This is very important, especially if you're creating a dashboard for an executive who may not be familiar with Tableau. So you need to understand your audience's analytical maturity to, uh, to develop a solution that is best fit for your audience. If it's more of an executive, somebody who isn't familiar with Tableau, you wanna make sure it's not very interactive versus an analyst or a manager who's familiar with Tableau, uses it day in and day out, then they are someone who doesn't mind interacting with it. So before you create your dashboard, you wanna make sure you really understand your audience's analytical maturity. You want to start to look at the, the end user preferences. So what are some colors that your end users would like to see in their dashboard? Are there particular logos that they would like to see? Do they prefer to see this dashboard sized a particular way? Fourth, you want to refine and prioritize those business questions. Typically in the consulting world, world when I'm given a, a project, there are a million questions from the end users. And unfortunately, all of those questions cannot be answered by the dashboard. So we need to refine those, those questions and make sure that we're prioritizing them. Next, you want to do a, a high level data discovery. So, uh, as I mentioned, you're given a bunch of requirements and sometimes the data just isn't there to answer those questions. So before you even start creating a dashboard or any type of visualization, you have to make sure that you look at the data and understand if it's uh, if it's available in order to answer those questions. And then last but not least, you want to then determine the views that are going to be needed in order to answer the questions. Should we create a bar chart? Should this be an aggregated number? Should this be a trend? Things like that. So to help you bring all of the, that together, I've created a dashboard requirements document that provides not only information about the dashboard itself, but information and details about the views that are going to be needed to create it. And at the end of this presentation, I'll show you all where you can download this requirements document for free. So let's run through the dashboard overview. The first thing that you want to do is provide the name of the dashboard along with the goal and an estimated time frame. Second, you wanna understand your audience. You wanna understand exactly how familiar they are with Tableau, who's going to be using this dashboard. You can select as many as you like. However, you wanna make sure that you're choosing, you know, maybe two that are closer to each other. You essentially cannot create a dashboard that's going to be for an executive as well as an analyst because they're on two different types of, types of the scale. So you wanna make sure that you understand how familiar your audience is with this dashboard or, or with this tool. 
Next, you want to look at the display mode. Is this going to be used on a laptop or a tablet or a mobile device? There have been many times where we've created dashboards that were for laptops and the, the client then asks, you know, can we create a mobile version? And as you know, sometimes it's a little difficult to redesign a dashboard to fit into mobile or to resize a dashboard that has been created for a desktop. I don't know how many of you have run into the issue where you've created a, a dashboard and sized it with a fixed width and a fixed height, and then all of a sudden, the client has asked you to maybe add more information and increase the height of it. And if that dashboard was all floating, then it's somewhat of a pain to have to resize that dashboard. So you wanna understand your requirements pretty early. Next, what's the use case going to be for it? Is it a web dashboard? Is it gonna be hosted on the web? Can we enable some scrolling if it's on the web, maybe vertical scrolling? Versus if it, is it gonna be uh, more of a static format? So are your end users looking to print this to a PDF or a PowerPoint or an image? Meaning these are things that you probably wanna size your dashboard accordingly so that it can fit to a paper or fit to a PowerPoint slide or best fit to an image. And last but not least, what are the dashboard filters and notes that, that, that should be applied to it? So are there particular filters like a year that should be applied to everything on the dashboard? Should we start to incorporate various colors and logos and icons and whatnot? And all of that information should be placed within the dashboard filters and notes section. Next, we'll transition to the view. So I consider a view one worksheet and in Tableau, there's a worksheet, a dashboard and a story. And we know a worksheet creates a single view. So a single bar chart, a single trend. Uh, and then you have your dashboard that combines all of those worksheets or those views together. So here is the view requirement, which allows you to detail information needed just for one worksheet. So you'll start with the name of the worksheet and provide a high level description of it. Next, you'll go into information on what are the primary dimensions and measures that are going to be needed in order to create this view. Do we need to look at the category, which is going to be your primary dimension? Are we going to look at the sales? That will be your primary measure. Next, are there any calculations that need to be created in order to uh, use any of these primary measures or additional measures? Say, for instance, you're looking at the profit ratio. That's the sum of profit divided by the sum of sales. You want to make sure that your end users or uh, whoever's looking at this provides you with that information on how to get to some of these calculations. Next, how should this view be formatted? Should we color the top bar? Should we sort this from highest to lowest? Things like that. Should anything be placed on size? Are there any filters that we should consider? Not dashboard filters, but just filters just for this particular worksheet. Where is the data coming from? Are there any joins that need to be done in order to create this one view? What are the credentials for that? And then last but not least, are there any additional notes or preferences that uh, the user didn't know? So, so is there a particular view that you want to see for this worksheet. So sometimes you're given a requirement and a user already has a chart for it in mind. So if they have that chart in mind, then be sure to place that in the additional notes section. So let's look at it in action. Here's a use case. The VP of sales wants to keep track of sales generated within the company. Overall, he or she wants to know how much each region brings in and which segment generates the most revenue for each region. Currently, this information is provided in an Excel workbook and shows sales per category, sales per segment, monthly sales, and the number of orders. So here's what that dashboard looks like within Excel, right? So now let's look at the goals for this new dashboard. At a high level, the goal is to create an interactive dashboard that analyzes the company's sales data that can be shared with the regional leads as well as the VP of the sales team. Which subcategories have the highest sales? What are the sales per region over time? What are the sales profit and profit ratio for each region? What are the sales per state? And which segment and region have the highest sales? Now we'll take all of this information and begin to plug it into this dashboard, uh, this dashboard requirements document. So on the left-hand side here, we've just outlined information about the dashboard itself. So we have the name of it, which is a Superstore scorecard. We've input the goal of it. We've selected the executive and the management team. So the VP and the man and the regional leads are going to be the audience. The display mode, we've noted it as a laptop that can be fit 1100 by 1000. The use case for it will be both the web and the PDF. And then we've detailed out additional information about the dashboard itself. So dashboard filters are going to be the year, category, ship mode, and product name. And we've uh, enlisted the company colors that should be used on the dashboard and also attached an example of something that the user found useful that they saw on the web that could essentially be duplicated or used within the final dashboard or the worksheets. 
Next to the right, I've taken one of those questions and created a worksheet for it. So here's how we have detailed out the view requirements. So the one that we're going to look at is the metric details per region. And this is going to provide information on the customers, the orders, the sales, the profit, and the profit ratio per region. The data fields that we're going to need in order to create this view will be the region as our primary dimension. The customer's order, sales, profit, and profit ratio will be our primary measures. Down below, we have to calculate some of these. So customers is going to be account distinctive customer ID, our primary indicator. Orders will be account distinctive order ID. And then the profit ratio will be the sum of profit divided by the sum of sales. In terms of formatting and filters, we don't need anything else applied to this particular worksheet. The data can be sourced from the Google Cloud SQL. Essentially, this is the Superstore data set. But if it were to be a, a, a data source, these were the credentials and whatnot down here. And then additional notes, the user has noted that they would prefer to see this as a text table. So you'll take all of that and you'll create one page for every single view slash chart that, that, that the, the user has requested. So for every single question, we're going to create a view, a view requirements document for it. And when you put it all together, you'll have your dashboard uh, cover, and then you'll also have a sheet for each of your views. So that's requiring that's, uh, you know, understanding your requirements and gathering them before you even start the, the visualization process. So next, let's talk about creating a template. Once you've analyzed your data and determined the insight that you would like to convey to your audience, create a grid like template to help organize your thoughts. So what are some things that should go into the template? So first, you want to make sure that you're prioritizing your requirements and only using what it, what's important. We can't have a million worksheets on the dashboard. So this is really important in understanding exactly what should be placed on this dashboard. So here are all of the requirements from the previous use case that I just displayed. And what we've done here is we've listed these, these requirements from in order of priority. So number one, the user wants to understand the overall number of customers, order sales and profit. Number two, monthly sales per region. Three, metric details per region. Four, region segment sales sales per state, and last but not least, sales per subcategory. So we've taken all of those questions and we've prioritized them. So that's step one. Two, you want to use, you, you want to use blank text boxes or pen or paper to start to outline what this dashboard could potentially look like. So I like to use blank text boxes within Tableau. And when I do that, I'm simply dragging a text box to the dashboard and I'm inputting exactly the view name as well as the chart type that we're going to use. So here I've, I've outlined the dashboard with just blank text boxes. I place placeholders for the filters, placeholders for each of the aggregated numbers and placeholders for each of the charts. Make sure that you're designing to a grid and this is a, a point that was made very clear within the big book of dashboards and it's also a point that's made with a lot of graphic designers or, or folks who are designing websites ui designers and whatnot you always want to make sure that you're designing to a grid so that it's easier for your end users to follow your story users typically read in the form of a z you start at the very top left hand corner and then you go to the right top and then down so you want to make sure that you're designing to a grid when you start to build out your templates. So in this example, we've designed to a five chart grid. As you can see here, I've perfectly aligned the sales per state with the three charts above it. So even though we have an odd number of charts, we're still able to design to a perfect grid by uh, double checking our alignment and making sure that we're snapping you know, to, to the lines above it. Here's an example of a four chart grid. It's easier to do with, with four charts because it's a, a, an even number. So you just have chart one, chart two, chart three, and chart four. What about a three chart grid? We have our main chart on the left-hand side followed by, followed by chart two and chart three. Next, you wanna to start to think about bands. Incorporate bands and add context to them. So for those of you who do not know what a band is, it's a, a big angry number. You can substitute the A for whatever you please. Uh, but it's a big angry number. It's typically an aggregated number that just summarizes your dashboard, summarizes some, some high level uh, metrics for your end users. I typically incorporate these bands at the top or the left hand side. And this is because, as I mentioned, your users are reading top down, left, right. 
So you want to make sure that your bands are are your summary. They're, they're, they're at the top of the dashboard so that your users understand what's going on in the dashboard before you present them with the details. So I like to tell my users, what are the overall sales before I tell them what are the sales per region? So if they wanted to know how the company is doing at a whole, as a whole, they can see, uh, typically just refer to the band uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the top part of the chart. So here's an example of a left-sided band. What you don't want to do is place your band on the right-hand side or at the bottom. As I said, your band is typically what your user will first see and first refer to. On the right-hand side, your users are looking at these charts first before they even look at your band. And same thing for the bottom. They're looking at all of the charts first before they look at your band. So try not to place them at the right or at the bottom of your dashboard. Next, you want to use size and position to show hierarchy. So we've taken each of those requirements and we've laid them out in the dashboard based off of order of importance. So our bands are at the top because they were the, 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 the highest prioritized from the client. So we wanna make sure that those are up top. So that's number one. Then we've taken each of those, those requirements, the number that was assigned to them based off of order of priority, and then we've laid them out on the dashboard. So here you have number two, number three, number four, number five, and number six following that level of priority that we've already discussed. And last but not least, you want to begin to think about icons and the use of color. So here on the left-hand side, I've placed icons next to each of the bands, right? On the right-hand side, icons are placed next to the filters and next to the headers. You don't wanna overcomplicate your, your icons, right? Your icons are just supposed to add a bit of aesthetics, a bit of visual appeal to your dashboard. So you don't want to place them everywhere. You just wanna place them in certain areas that they would make the most sense. So in this instance, I've placed the bands just, I've placed the icons just by the bands and I haven't placed them anywhere else on the dashboard because I want the users to focus on the, the rest of the charts. And then in terms of a logo, if you have a logo, I typically place that either at the top right or the top left of the dashboard. So nowhere in the center, um, nowhere, you know, floating at the bottom. I typically place that at the top right hand corner. So once you've created your template in Tableau, the next step is to fill in your template. So we've taken this template that you see on the left and we filled it in with the charts and the worksheets that we've created. So we filled in all of the bands, we filled in all of the filters, we placed the logo at the top right. This was a, a dashboard I created for the Tableau conference. So that's why you see the Tableau conference logo there. Filled in the title, we've added the icons here, incorporated the line chart, the text table, as well as the highlight map. We have our states map down below and then our bar chart for the sales per subcategory. So we've taken this and then we filled it in with this all within Tableau. So here are the, the, the template guidelines. So once you have your template, reuse your template, right? I typically use templates over and over again. It's easier than starting from scratch and trying to come up with a new idea. So here's an example of a visualization that I created on the left hand side a couple of years ago. And then you fast forward a couple months forward when users aren't thinking about this one anymore. And I've used the exact same template, right? So here I have the same uh, icons and boxes up top. I have the same four chart grid down below. Given that it's different data, the layout is exactly the same. And I didn't have to rethink about how I wanted to lay out this information. I simply went to a visualization that I've already created and then filled it in. Here's another example of how I, I like to fill in visualizations. So on the left-hand side, I created this visualization that has the map on the left, and then it has all of the details with nice little headers right here to the right. And I did that exact same thing with a, another visualization a couple of months later. So as I mentioned, don't create from scratch. Uh, just try to use your templates over and over again, especially if it's a good template. So to wrap up your templates, layout, fill in, reuse, keep it simple. Let's talk about using art to your advantage. Using simple images and icons can take your dashboard to from basic to visually appealing. What are the guidelines for that? So first, when you're selecting icons, you want to make sure that they uh, communicate meaning and they are easy to recognize. So down below, you see we have the house, the information icon, and a data source icon. The house icon typically uh, resonates with your user as going back to the home page. The information icon is easy to understand because users uh, uh, resonate with this by 
looking for more information about something that they're viewing. And then a data source icon either means they're going to view the data source or they're going to find out more information about the data source itself. So make sure that you're creating icons that are easy to recognize and communicate meaning. So in this example here for the use case that we've been, been working with, I've used the person icon to identify the person, so the number of customers. I use the box to identify the orders that have been shipped. So you're, when you ship an order, you typically send it in a box to your customers. So we use the box to identify orders. Next, we use the sales tag to identify sales. And then we use the, the money bag, so the money that's left over, to identify our profit. So here we're selecting icons that communicate meaning and are, and are easy to recognize. Next, you wanna include a label or provide context. So typically when you're working with bands, the context is gonna be the band label. So if we're looking at sales and we have the number for sales, the band for it, the icon is gonna resonate with whatever the label is. But say for instance, you didn't have your icons next to your bands or your aggregated numbers. If they're anywhere else on the dashboard, you need to make sure that your, your users understand exactly what the icon means and how to interact with it. So for the home icon here, we've placed click to return to main page, right? So don't just have a home icon on your dashboard and expect your users to understand to click on it. Here for the information icon, we've added a subtitle that says hover for dashboard description and information. And last but not least, we've added a description for the data source icon to hover to view information on the data source. So include a label or provide context. In this example, as I mentioned, when you have an icon next to a band, your band label resonates with the icon. So I didn't have to relabel that this person uh, stands for customers because I've already labeled it for the, the band here. But here we have the customers, the orders, the sales, and the profit. In this example, I wanted the end users to click on the Tableau conference icon and go back to the Tableau uh, conference homepage. So in order to allow the users to do that or to tell them, I've simply placed underneath it, click to view conference homepage. However, if you're dealing with limited real estate, you can use a tooltip. You can create a worksheet that has a tooltip with the uh, click icon. And whenever they hover over that area, it's going to say click to view conference homepage. So never let your, your users wonder or guess if there's any sort of interaction with an icon or anything, make sure you're telling your users exactly how to interact with it. Never assume. Next, simple is okay, nothing too creative. So here, a regular house is okay. We don't need a house that's two stories that has a door and a couple of windows. We don't need that, right? A simple house is okay. When you take this icon and you make it really small, it starts to become harder to see and understand. So make sure you're selecting icons that are simple and not too creative. So here I've selected a simple silhouette of a person, a box, a sales tag, and a money bag. What you did not see me do was create a customer that had a bun and a beard, a box that had holes in it. Uh, I don't even know what this is, but it has dollar signs, so I assume that it means something with sales, or a manager that's outside the store that has money. On the dashboard, it may look good to you, but it's a little hard to read, right? Choose icons that are simple. You don't want it to take away from your dashboard or the context of your visualizations. Nothing distracting. Keep styles consistent and cohesive. So what do we mean by that? The top layer that you see here, all of the icons are shaded. They're all solid icons, right? They're consistent, they're cohesive in how they look. The second shelf here, we have the house icon and the information icon that are solid. However, the data source icon is shaded and it's kind of distracting when you look at it compared to the other two. And then on the last shelf here, we have the house icon and the data source icon that are shaded, but then the information icon is a silhouette. So you wanna make sure that you're keeping your icons consistent and cohesive so that they all look the same. They all follow the same structure and one icon isn't uh, bringing more attention to itself than the other icons. So here on this dashboard, as you can see, this shaded customer icon sticks out way more than the other silhouette icons, right? So we don't want to do that. In this example, every icon that you see on the dashboard is shaded, it's solid. We haven't incorporated any silhouette icons because everything is, is solid and we, we've kept that theme going. In this TEDx visualization, the same thing. Everywhere you see an icon or an image, it's solid. You also want to make sure that you're using the dashboard theme and the color scheme. 
So here our dashboard theme is purple. So I should not be placing a blue, red, or green icon on the dashboard. It's going to stick out. And as I mentioned, you want to just make sure that everything is going with the flow. Nothing is distracting away from your true message, which is visualization. So in this example, even though the brand colors had blue a part of it, nowhere else in our dashboard did we use blue. So we should not try to use blue or this green within the icons. Um, in the band area, we want to make sure that it's staying with the dashboard theme and overall color scheme. And last but not least, reduce the icon graphic details. So as you see here, we have the house and this kind of goes hand in hand with being simple and not too creative. We have the house and then we have a silhouette house that has a lot of graphic detail to it. It's very hard to see once a user starts to once you minimize this on a dashboard especially if you're dealing with a phone, like a mobile device. Users can't really see this when it gets smaller. And the same thing for the information icon. You don't wanna to have too much graphic detail with a lots of color uh, in, your, in your icons. Here's what it looks like if you add a lot of detail to those icons. They start to blur out. All of those lines are really hard to see. They don't make sense. Here, while they're large, you can tell exactly what they are, but on your dashboard, when they're rather small, you know, it's kind of hard to see. And if you do decide that you want to place, you know, something with a lot of graphic detail, please don't enlarge it to take up this entire space right here just to show the details. Just go ahead and swap it out for a simpler icon, right? It's okay. So here are the icon and art guidelines. Do not limit your creativity though. If you decide to use creative icons, be sure that they are large enough in the viz for the end user to understand. Now, I know that sometimes I like to use creative icons, but when I do, I make sure that they are large enough so that they're adding to the visualization and so that the end users can identify exactly what they are. So in this example here, I wanted to add a spaceman for the ISS spacewalks. So I made sure that this icon was large enough so that the user can see the graphic details associated with it, right? It's not overpowering, it's not taking up too much of the visualization, but it's large enough to tell all of the details. In this example, we're looking at the ecological footprint and I've created this, this icon and I made sure that it was large enough on the dashboard so that the user can see it. And what you'll notice here is that typically when I include a large icon in the top left of the dashboard, I don't really include icons anywhere else. This large icon speaks a lot of value, volume, like a high volume within your visualization. So there's no need to incorporate smaller icons anywhere else because this is a statement piece in itself. Where do I get icons from? I know some of you are probably wondering. I typically use flaticon.com, the noun project, and icons8, and that's the order that I use them in. I always go to flat icon first because you can create a free account you can edit icons. So if an icon doesn't have the color that you want, you can edit the icon as long as you have that free account and you're signed in and you can change the color of them. These two icons that you see here, these were not the original colors. I went ahead and changed them to match the, the flow and the color scheme of my dashboard. So now let's talk about choosing colors that matter. So first you want to let your brand colors form the basis, right? So in this example here, we received a color palette for the Tableau conference. So here are the Tableau conferences color, color themes. And we've used the color palette to form the dominant colors of our visualizations. We've made sure to use this purple and this light gray within the viz. I've used the purples for a lot of the, the, the headers, the titles, as well as any shading that's on the, the dashboard. In this example, we've used or I've used the, the LinkedIn color palette to create the background uh, color scheme for this visualization. So we, we stuck with the LinkedIn blue and the white as well as the gray. So let your brand colors form the basis of your visualization first. And in this example, the Women's March was a visualization created a couple of years ago when the first Women's March took place. I've used the brand colors of the Women's March icon to form all of the colors that you now see on the dashboard. Next, get inspiration from other art and other visualizations. There are a lot of great artists and dashboard creators out there, right? So typically, whenever I start with a visualization, I go to Google. It's my, it's my best friend, right? 
I type in the name or the theme of the visualization and I put the word infographic at the end of it just so I can see what appears. What are some visualizations that were already created out there that might have a healthcare look and feel to it? So for a visualization I created not too long ago, I simply went to Google, typed in info, healthcare infographic, and here's the visualization that I saw on the right hand side that stuck out the most to me. And if you all are paying attention a little bit earlier, this looks very similar to a visualization that I recreated. I like the color scheme of this visualization, the blue, the, the green with the red and the white. I like the borders that you see here. I like the flow of it. And I decided to take that visualization and create the visualization that you see on the right hand side. So here is where I started with Google, typed in the theme, put the word infographic at the end of it found a visualization that I liked, and then use bits and pieces of it to create my own. Another example that I did was an earthquake visualization. So I typed in earthquake infographic and the visualization that you see to the right stuck out the most to me. What I liked about this visualization was that if we're looking at earthquakes, up top you have like that world view, like the day view, but then you have down below like the ground theme, the, the light tan and the, the pink or the salmon color. And I like this visualization. I liked everything about it. I like the color scheme. I like the map. I like the use of the, the dots. And I took this viz, took the colors from it and a bit of the layout. And I created the visualization that you see on the right hand side. So same colors, kind of the same layout, uh, a bit of the same theme. And what you see is that the break that you see for the left hand visualization is an area chart created in Tableau on the right hand side. So once again, going to Google, finding a visualization that speaks volume to me, downloading it, taking the colors, and then creating my own visualization using bits and pieces of it. Next, you wanna make sure that you're limiting the number of dominant colors within your visualization. I typically only use two. So here, even though we have about five different colors that came from the client and our client, I'll say is Tableau Conference, I've only selected one of those colors to be the dominant color in the visualization. I did not try to incorporate every single brand color here. And I've seen way too many use cases where designers or developers are trying to incorporate every single brand color for whatever company they're working with. It's okay not to do that. Just figure out the dominant color, the most primary color for it, and then use that in your visualization. And then use the other, you know, more neutral colors, your grays, your whites, your blacks, to form the rest of the visualization. Here, I use the yellow as the dominant color in this visualization and everything else was black, white, or gray. So it's okay to just have one pop of color on your visualization. It's okay to have two, but I feel like anything more than two is just you know a lot of noise and, and it could be a little bit confusing for your end users. In this example, we have two dominant colors. So here I've used two dominant colors. The blue is really the background of the visualization. So some may consider it a dominant color. Some may consider it more of a neutral color because it resembles closely with like black and having a black background. But then the salmon is not. So the salmon color that you see here is not a uh, neutral color. It's more of a dominant color. And everything else was more neutral tan. So using just two colors to form the basis of this visualization. What you did not see me do is incorporate, as I mentioned, every single color that came from the brand. In this example that you see to the right, it's a typical no-no, especially when you're looking at a, a uniform metric within the dashboard. This entire dashboard is looking at sales, so you want to make sure that sales is represented as the same color in every piece of your dashboard. Here, this is sales per month, this is sales per segment, sales per state. So if everything is sales, why use a different color to represent sales? Make sure that sales is staying one consistent color throughout your visualization. Next, you want to make sure you're creating accessible color schemes and that you're testing them. So here, this visualization on the left-hand side, I took this visualization and I plugged it into a color blindness simulator just so I can see with someone with a color deficiency what it would look like to them. So for somebody who's red weak, red blind, green weak, green blind, blue weak, blue blind, the visualization still works. The only thing that I really want to stick out to our end users is the shading on the map as well as the shading in the segment table that you see here. And for any type of color deficiency, that stands out pretty clear. 
right? For even blue blind, you can tell that the darker color here is like higher sales. You can differentiate between the darker color here as well. So you wanna make sure that you're creating accessible color schemes and definitely uh, testing them, never assume. In this visualization here, I wanted to make sure that the end user can see the shading here within this chart and the shading on the map. So the shading on the map is just saying these are higher areas where bikes are stolen in the UK. On the right hand side, I just wanted the user to make sure that they can see the pop of red, which indicates that more bikes were stolen during these months and these years. So I took this visualization and passed it through the simulator. And even though it changes color based off of the color deficiency, the idea is still the same. Here you can still see the darker green standing out from the, the other color, like the white. And the same thing for the visualization to the right of it. So make sure, like I said, you're creating these, these color schemes and testing them. Unfortunately, if you use the red and green color palette within Tableau for um, the divergent color palette, it's not going to provide you with an accessible color scheme, right? So here, it's very hard to tell if the dark for Texas and the dark for California, if that's positive or negative, if that's good or bad. So using that, that green and that, that red, you wanna make sure that you're using them on different scales so that your end users can understand exactly what they're looking at. So to wrap that up, make sure you're creating accessible color schemes and testing them. Use color purposefully and for reinforcement. In this example here, there are two colors that I've used in this visualization outside of the black. I've used the yellow and I used the gray. The yellow everywhere you see it on the dashboard means that it's high sunlight, high sunshine hours. Everywhere you see gray, that means that it's low sunshine hours. So I'm using color purposefully to allow the user to continue to see what the, the most and the least is. So use color purposefully um, throughout your visualizations. Be very strategic with how you're using color. In this example here, we're looking at the top three restricted dietary requirements around the world. Every time there is a top dietary requirement, I've highlighted that in blue. I've also drawn additional attention to it in the paragraph below. So in North America, sugar conscience is the highest dietary requirement. So I've highlighted the bar blue and I've also outlined sugar conscience within the paragraph so that your user's eyes are automatically drawn to this bar and this word. So we've done that for each of the regions that you see around the globe. And last but not least, in this example, uh, we're looking at the freedom of press in 2017. Everywhere that you see green means that countries are rated as free press. Everywhere that you see yellow, countries are rated as partly free press. And everywhere that you see purple, countries are, are, are rated as not free press. So I've kept those colors consistent. I've used color purposefully to make sure that everywhere I use one color within a visualization, that it meant the same thing throughout. And last but not least, if you are stuck, um, on how to pick colors for your dashboard, go ahead and design it in grayscale first and then add color to highlight it. So I'll walk you through that. Here's that same visualization without any color added to it, right? It's a simple, plain visualization. It has all of the charts in, in it that the client was looking for, but now we wanna start to add color to it to make it pop. So the first thing we'll do is we'll choose colors for titles, filters, and band areas. And on the left-hand side, I've shaded the, the title, I placed a border around the band area and I left the filter alone. So typically if I shade or put a border around the title, I'll leave the filter section and then I'll probably put a border or some form of shading around the, the band area. You'll never see me have a shading, a border and a border because that's just too many lines that are cluttered next to each other. In this example, I didn't shade the title. However, I put, placed a line underneath to differentiate between the section of the title and where the filters start. Next, you wanna look at each chart individually and determine is there anything that you wanna highlight? So let's start. Here, the only thing that we wanna highlight in the first row is probably the segment chart, right? So sales per region, we don't really need to highlight anything with this line chart. The point here already highlights the max, so we don't really need to draw any additional attention to it. The metric details chart is fine. It's a text table. We don't need to highlight anything there. We don't need to call additional attention to, the, to these numbers. But here, we probably want to highlight which segment had the highest sales for which region. So we'll go ahead and add color to just this one chart. So it's easier to identify instead of reading all of these and trying to figure out which intersection between segment and region had the highest sales. 
Next, let's look at our sales per state, right? These are a lot of numbers here and a lot of dots for each of the states. So we probably wanna add some color to help the user easily identify which sales had the, which state had the highest sales. So we've added color to now determine that California had the highest sales. And it's easier to, to look at instead of looking at a dot with a number. And last but not least, this chart that you see on the bottom right hand side, it's already sorted from highest to lowest. There's no need to add an additional level of coloring to it. We're already serving its purpose by sorting it. So I'll typically take that chart and just add a light, a neutral color to it so that it doesn't stick out. Next, you want to add final touches to your worksheet titles and your dashboard footer. You want to test shadings, borders, and, and various borders and various font colors. So here I've added a, a border or excuse me, a shading to each of the, the section titles. It's very distracting. I don't know about you all, but to me, this is very distracting. It's overpowering. It's taken away from the visualization itself, right? And here in this example, there are a lot of borders, right? So I, as I mentioned, I typically do not like to have a border next to another border. It's, it's somewhat distracting. It looks a little cluttered. So when you're starting to assign colors to headers and, and section out your dashboard, be very strategic with that as well. Try to use a neutral color for those, for those headers, or there's no need to use a color at all. Maybe you can just increase the font size of your, of your section header and change the color of it. There's no need to draw additional attention to it. So stay away from those thick, dark background colors as well as those thick borders. So here are those color guidelines. Last but not least, let's talk about uncomplicating fonts. The first thing that you want to make sure that you're doing when you're selecting fonts for your dashboard is that you stick to one legible font and the keyword there is legible. In this example, even though we, we, we've used one font on the dashboard, uh, it's not very legible, right? It's, it's bold, it's hard to see, uh, it, it doesn't translate well with the end user. So make sure you're selecting fonts that are legible and one consistent font throughout your dashboard. In this example, we're using Tableau font throughout. Yes, we've added some bolding and we, we, we've done a couple of things with it, but the font style itself is consistent and it's legible. In this example, we're using Times New Roman, right? Everywhere you see uh, words, we're using Times New Roman for everything. So make sure you're sticking to one legible font. Next, you wanna make sure that you have no more than four sizes of that font type. So I typically section out the four font sizes as your dashboard titles, your worksheet titles, your chart headers, and your worksheet panes and additional text. And I provided kind of examples of how I size those things. So dashboard titles, typically size them between 22 and 28. I want the title to stick out. I want to draw attention to the title. Worksheet titles, I'll keep it anywhere from 11 to 14. I never use the default title setting of 15 when it comes into a dashboard. So I don't know if you all have noticed, but whenever you bring a worksheet onto your dashboard, the automatic size for a worksheet title is Tableau book size 15. I never use the default. I think it's a little bit too large. Next, you wanna look at your chart headers, which are the region headers here and the subcategories here. And I typically keep those about a size nine through 10. And then in terms of the additional pane context, and those texts, which you'll see are the numbers here, I keep that about an eight to 10. So on this dashboard, I've narrowed it down to a size 22, size 14, size nine, and a size nine. You wanna stay away from custom fonts if possible. Why? On the left-hand side is a native Mac font. However, when you take this and you place it on a Windows computer or you upload it to Tableau Public or Tableau Online or Tableau Server, this is what it looks like. It changes the style of your font. It, everything is now bolded, right? It takes up a lot of room. So your native fonts may not translate well to other devices or, you know, when you publish it and share it with your end users. So here are a list of those Tableau Online compatible fonts, right? Arial, uh, Georgia, the Tableau one is probably your safest one. It translates to every single browser and every computer every device that's running Tableau in general. So here are your Tableau online compatible fonts if you're ever wondering which fonts work best uh, when you're publishing. Next, you wanna be very strategic with fonts and background colors. And this goes back to accessibility, but we're talking about contrast accessibility now, color contrast accessibility. 
So here's a tool that I like to use, AccessibleColors.com, that allows you to test your text color and your background color and determine if it is web content um, accessible. So do, do it follow the WCAG guidelines, which are your web content accessibility guidelines. Double uh, A compliant means it's, it's medium. The, the highest is triple A, the lowest is A. A by itself really isn't good. You at least want it to be uh, the double A compliant. So what I do here is I take the background color, which is the dark gray, I plug it in here. So hashtag with all of the threes. You take your font color, which is this blue. So any type of color that you have on your for a font, you want to plug that in here and you will take the lowest size of that font. So even though I have a size of about 20 up top, I've taken the lowest size, which is nine, and I've tested it to make sure that the end users can see that contrast between the blue and the back, the, the dark background pretty easily. And it passed. So it has a high contrast, and the required contrast for AA compliance is 4.5. Here in this example, if I've simply lightened that background, my dashboard is no longer uh, accessible. It's hard to differentiate between the blue and the now light gray background. And this tool is really neat because even though it fails, it, pat it shows you two other options. So what happens when you change the background color? Um, it can pass. Or what happens if you change the text color? It can pass as well. So it provides you with two additional options. You want to use color and or bold text to emphasize. So in this example, I've used red in the paragraph up top to emphasize things that I want the user's eye to go to automatically. So if you're providing large bodies of text on a dashboard, you want to highlight things that should, your users should catch with their eye. If I did not highlight it, you'll see on the left hand side, nothing really sticks out. You would have to assume that the user spent the time to read this paragraph. Versus if you simply highlight the year, the number of respondents, the overall percentage, uh, as well as the, the overall percentage for HBCU graduates, which stands for historically black college university graduates versus non HBCU graduates. It kind of just sticks out. The user doesn't have to read the entire paragraph to get what the dashboard is showing or get the, the context of this paragraph. Last but not least, you want to align left or right and stay away from center alignment. To be very specific, you want to align left. Only align right if you are doing it for design purposes, which is pretty much just a timeline or where it would make sense. Users cannot read uh, right or center aligned text as fast as they can read left aligned text. It's all about that Z pattern and the start and the, the end of the sentence. So in this example, uh, I've aligned left and right based off of the break of this line. So everywhere, if we zoom in to the right, everything that's to the left of the line, we've aligned right. Everything that's to the right of the line, we've aligned left. And this is an example of where you want to be very careful how you left and right align. I typically wouldn't let, uh, right align, but it just makes sense for the purpose of a timeline. However, you do not want to censor align a lot of text. It's harder to read. Your users have to go in, then go out, then go in, then go out to read this paragraph. So be very careful when you're looking at the alignment of your text. So here are those font guidelines. So I'd like to provide you all with a couple of business examples. I know this entire presentation, I pretty much showed you all things from my personal portfolio, but just so you know, these are the same type of guidelines that I use on my everyday job. So in this example here, we are looking at the uh, sales per region. And as you see here, everything is designed to a grid. We have a perfect grid here, right? It's easy to understand. We've incorporated small icons to add visual appeal. These icons are small, they're consistent in style, they're all shaded, including the export icons up top. I've used one compatible font throughout this entire dashboard, right? And the only time that I've used color is to differentiate between positive and negative. And before you ask, the green and the red here has been passed through the uh, accessible, uh, the color accessibility test. So I've made sure that I use the specific hex codes that allow the users to differentiate between positive and negative. And then to add to that, I've also incorporated another level of detail, which are the arrows. So if the user cannot see the difference between the red and the green, I've also indicated with an up or down arrow exactly what that means. And that, uh, uh, last but not least, here's another example of a dashboard 
uh, that looks at the paid um, social content for, for a website for, for our marketing. So everything here is once again designed to a grid. Everything is completely laid out. It aligns here as well. Uh, the icons that we use are very small and consistent. The icons for each of the media types are also small and consistent in style. Uh, we've used color to differentiate between um, the, the latest months that are selected. And then we've used one accessible uh, font. We've tested the color. So the light gray hair was tested against the dark gray background. And if a user is having trouble looking at this dark gray, made sure to incorporate a light version of it by simply selecting the button in the top uh, left hand corner so a user can toggle with this button on the live dashboard so to summarize everything that, that i discussed uh, one you want to start with your audience and their requirements two you want to build your template and add your views three you want to incorporate design elements that will enhance your stories and four you want to Add color strategically, icons for charm, and use the rule, rule of four when selecting fonts. I'll leave you all with this quote. Anyone can be a designer. It's not something that you're born with. It's not something exclusive to a select few. All it takes is practice while keeping a few design secrets in mind. And with that, I am Chantilly Jagnarth. Here is my contact information, my email address, my Twitter handle, as well as the website for you to download the requirements document, as well as look at other examples. So I post quite frequently to this. And with that, I would like to introduce your next speaker, Jacint Walker. Uh, Jacint is a good friend of mine. She took a Tableau class that I had, I held last year. And from there, Jacint really just, you know, loved everything about it and started taking these basic design elements and incorporating them into her everyday dashboards. So even though Jacint has just been using Tableau for about a year, um, she's been able to create some really amazing visualization. So with that, I'll turn it over to Jacint so that she can show you a simple uh, visualization that she created that has each of these design elements. So with that, I'll stop sharing and Jacint, I will pass the ball to you. All righty. Hello, everyone. Can, can you see me? See my screen and hear me? Yep, we can hear you just then. Alrighty. Good. Hi, everyone. Thank you guys for tuning in to listen to us speak. My name is Jacent Walker. <laughs> My name is Jacent Walker, and I will be talking to you guys about simple design. So a little bit about me. I am a non-designer, much like Chantilly. Uh, my background is in healthcare. I've been doing, I was doing that for over four years, and now I've transitioned into a consultant role at Capgemini, uh, focusing on data analytics. And I've been using Tableau almost one year now. So in two weeks, it'll be a year. I, when I was getting my master's, Chantilly brought her program to my school and I took her Millennials in Data program, which introduced me to Tableau and I've been using it ever since. So what I'm going to take you through today will show you a few simple charts um, that have a beautiful design, but the charts themselves are simple. So we're really going to focus on how you can use design to take your dashboard to the next level. I'll be focusing specifically on an airline dashboard that I did that tracks um, that tracks uh, TSA throughput between the past month and the same time last year. I'll go over the data set that I used, the template that I used, the charts that I used, and the design elements that I incorporated. So these are a few of the dashboards that I've done. Um, as you can see, my dashboards tend to be pretty simple. I love using bar charts and then just enhancing it by using color and images and icons and text. Uh, I, I did this coronavirus 
dashboard with Chantilly. It's a map, it uses bar charts and it has a line chart. This uh, Brexit bond, it's a graph that measures people's interest in different people playing the James Bond role. So females, minorities, gays, and non-British nationalities. There is a dashboard about women leadership. It's a simple bar chart, and then you enhance it with color. And then rural hospital closures, that is a hex map, which isn't as simple, but it's basically just a map. And then the bottom is a bar chart or a lollipop graph, which is just a bar chart with a ball at the end. So really simple charts and then really enhanced design. So this is the dashboard that I'm gonna be speaking about today. It's called Who's Flying Then Versus Now, and it's a comparison between airline travel in 2019 and currently in 2020. So I just wanna show you what it looks like in Tableau. And so this is it. You have two bar charts. One is 2020 data, one is 2019 data, and then you have a calendar of events which have text when you hover and then a line graph that shows coronavirus COVID-19 cases. So it's pretty simple, but I'll show you how I did not only the bar charts, but the background and the template that I used. So, so for the data set, this is actually just data off of the TSA website. This is the website here at the bottom. Um, they update it at nine o'clock every day. They count the number of people that travel through their checkpoints throughout the United States. And then they have another, um, another set of data that shows the total traveler throughput at the same time in, in last year. So it's the same weekday from exactly one year ago from the date that they have. So I just copied, I just copied this data and put it in Excel and then I connected it to Tableau. So getting into how I did the design. So I made the template using Figma, which is a UI tool. It's very simple and intuitive to use. Um, first, this if you look at the top here, I used this shapes tool to make rectangles. So all parts of the dashboard are just rectangles. So here you have the, the area where the bar chart was gonna be. And then I made a rectangle for the header or the title. And I made another one for the 2019 data. And then I just rounded the corners using this uh, corner rounding tool. So you can put a number in here and it'll round that corner to the number that you put in there. And then I made a rectangle for the header and a rectangle for each of the side panels that you see in the dashboard. So let's go to the charts. I'm gonna take it back to Tableau for that. So as I said, it's just a simple bar chart. I put the date in the columns and then the actual sum of the travelers on the rows and it just gave you a simple bar chart. The filter, it, there was one null in there, so I just filtered out the nulls, nothing spectacular. And so I made a bar chart for 2020 and a bar chart for 2019. And then for the line chart, this was a line chart that I made for another viz. So the coronavirus viz that I showed you earlier, I just um, basically copied the line chart from that data set and used it here. And then for each of the calendar events, so here, if you hover over each one, it tells you the date that an order was enacted that had an effect on airline travel. So on March 15th, the CDC said people couldn't gather in, in greater than 50. March 16th, several countries 
they impose restrictions. So if you hover, it's just more information. And for each of those, I just made a text table and put it in the tooltips and, and just inputted the text there. So as you can see, the, the, the charts were nothing extravagant. They're very simple. I think what really enhanced this dashboard was the overall layout. And if you can see here in the background, these were the Figma creations I, were telling, I was telling you about. So here you see the rectangle and then the title. Here you see this square. And th these are all inputted as images. So I, I made a tiled image and then each of these charts are floating on top of that. So let's go into some of the elements. So as far as the flow, we, I, we know we're going to be looking at a comparison between two years. Because I'm trying to emphasize the changes that came about with COVID-19, I wanted to put the most recent year, which is 2020, first. Because your eyes, it normally reads from left to right and top to bottom, you would see the top chart first. So I wanted that to be on top so that you could focus on that first. So there you have the 2020 data, and then you have the 2019, which is the comparison year below that. I made the bar charts larger than everything else on the dashboard because that's the most important data. You want the primary charts to be front and center, and then the secondary charts like the COVID cases or the calendar of events, those are kind of supporting information. So you make them a little smaller so they play a supporting role. As far as text, because I chose a dark background, the text had to be easy to read. So I chose this light gray text. It's already, your eye already has to make a little bit of an adjustment when reading something on a dark background. So I didn't wanna use uh, another color so that your eyes would have to make an, an additional adjustment to try to read that text. And then also I wanted to include information that hampered airline travel, but to put, input all of that information on the dashboard would have made it very text heavy and people, they don't want to read a lot of text. It makes it look cluttered. So that's how I decided to make, put this hover feature where you could hover to see additional information instead of making it clutter the dashboard. As for color, as Chantilly mentioned, you know, you don't want to go crazy with the colors. So because I was using two sets of information that was very important, I wanted them each to have their own color. I wanted them each to have their own color and every other color was monochromatic or neutral. So the, the description at the side, the calendar of events, the other line chart at the bottom, I didn't want to give that color to detract away from the, the comparison of the travelers. As far as art and icons, again, as Chantilly mentioned, you want that to enhance your dashboard. You don't want anything to take away. And you also want to use it purposefully. So I wanted to choose something that would help you know what I was talking about when looking at this dashboard. So if you look at the first thing in the upper left-hand corner, you see the globe with the, with the plane flying around it. So you can automatically deduce that this dashboard might be about planes or travel or something to that nature. So that's why I chose that icon that could help. And then I also impor imported the colors um, the blue for the water, the golden color for the land, just to just so that it could have a cohesive effect and everything would flow nicely. I got this image from Flat Icon. You can always edit the colors on there. And so that's where I got that image. So that was just a quick synopsis of how I made this dashboard and the thought process that I went through when creating it and how I chose colors, text, um, some of the charts that I chose to use and how I put it all together. So um, I all, whenever creating dashboards, I always try to incorporate the design secrets that Chantilly has taught. Um, they really can elevate your dashboard to the next level. Uh, even if it's simple, if you, if 
you incorporate icons and design and text and use these things purposefully, they can really take your dashboard to the next level. So I wanna thank you guys for um, tuning in and listening. Here's some contact inf information, my email. You can search me on LinkedIn by my name and also on Twitter, it's my name as well. So with that, we are going to uh, open up the floor for questions. We are gonna open up the floor for questions. Um, I believe Alyssa said that if you raise your hand, she can unmute you, or you can also type it in the question and answer box. Uh, and thank you guys for listening. Some questions. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes. Hi. Hi. Yes. Uh, my name is Jack. Uh, I'm with uh, Norfolk Woman. Uh, uh, we also have. Uh, we also use Tableau as one of our on our programs, and in addition, in addition to OBIE and Click. So just a little bit of background of uh, my current my current program. So first of all, uh, I want to you know <clears throat> thank you know, Chantilly and Jason. You guys did a fantastic job, you know, presenting. I mean, this like you know, from based on what I've class that I've taken, this is like you know, this is like very like um, simple and but straight straight to the point and very um, uh, educating. And uh, for, I have a couple of questions for Jason. Um, uh, I know, like I saw you, you have uh, two data sources. You mentioned one of the data sources you got it from uh, Excel spreadsheet. Uh, how about the other one, the uh, the one for the corona coronavirus? Um, did you, is that data source? Where does, where does that data source get the data from? Oh, that's a good question. So you're right. the The flight information it all came from TSA, but the COVID um, data that is pulled from John Hopkins. Uh, they have a data, they have data on the coronavirus. I think they have the most up-to-date data if I'm not mistaken. Um, Chantilly developed a workflow when we were creating our coronavirus dashboard that pulls the data directly from John Hopkins. And so that's where I, that's where I got that data. And I just literally copied the, uh, the line chart. So if, if you saw my Corona dashboard, it had a line chart on it. I literally copied the very same line chart from that from that dashboard. And then yeah, I so just changed the color. Yeah, I just changed the color. It's the same, it's the exact same dashboard. And then, then I filtered it so that it would be in the same time frame as um the airline data. I can I can add to that as well, Jacent. So on the Tableau public as well as the Tableau software site. They have a, a COVID-19 data hub, and they also clean the data and provide it in several formats. So CSV, um, you can do a direct Google Sheets connection to it as well. So that's another place that you can get the data if you didn't want to clean it the way that Jacinta and I did in creating our visualization. So just two places. The John Hopkins one is not clean. The Tableau one that is on the, the COVID-19 data hub is clean. Okay, thank you. Yes, I was just wondering where you guys <clears throat> got that data from. And uh, second question is, uh, just saying, uh, uh, on your graph, uh, the the I know you created one for two thousand the year two thousand twenty, and then two thousand nineteen. Uh, on the top of the chart, the the dashboard, you you use like uh, Dan is it Dan versus now. But in your by your 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 graphs is you show the uh, now first and then then is does it matter or or it doesn't it doesn't really matter. Well, when when I um when when I was creating it then versus now I just put it because 2019 comes before 2020. But I also color coded it, so I put the then in the gold color and the 2019 in the gold color and then the now in the blue color and the 2020 in the blue color. So even if there was any confusion created from then versus now, you would always know when then is it would be 2019 again using that color to in 
to add to the understanding of the dashboard. And you would know now is 2020 because it all follows the same color scheme. Right. Yeah, definitely. The, the color code, color code definitely helps to differentiate which one, uh, which one is for which year. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much for your questions. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, there were some questions in the the Q and A that I can I can walk through. So there was one, uh, Chantilia. I really like your work. The one dashboard is for John Hopkins was very good. My question is about text wrap. How to how do you handle the long field names, field values? Any tips uh, to deal with long field names would be helpful. So uh, field names or field members. So for field names themselves, I try to. I typically look at the values that come from each of the each of the fields and I try to decrease the font size of them. So on the dashboard itself, I've actually taken some of the font sizes down to uh, seven or eight, uh, especially with countries that have long names. So in the dashboard that uh, the person is is referring to, I have a visualization that that looks at the cases per country. So for countries that have really long names, I've made sure that the row header was uh, had a, a nice enough height so that the text could wrap evenly on the two lines. So you typically want to make sure that either you give enough uh, row width or row height for it to wrap on the next text. If you don't want it to wrap, then give it enough row width. And if you are fine with it wrapping, then make sure you have enough row height to it. And you can simply edit your row height by hovering in the header, the row header, looking for the vertical double headed arrow uh, and clicking and dragging down. Uh, other questions in the q and I'm trying to, to read through them. Um, We have one from Mike. I work with two separate data spreadsheets for a monthly report that I do. Shows several hundred thousand transactions and at least 21 different errors against three transactions, as well as a 30 day time frame of reflecting the data graphically. I need to know if there's a better way for me to reflect these three areas graphically, considering the number of transactions, the number of errors, and the 30 day time frame I have to depict. I usually have to use the 21 colors to reflect the error. So um, what I would do with that is, there is simply no way that your end user can differentiate between all 21 colors at one time. So what I would typically do for something like that is I would prioritize some of those errors. So are there some errors that um, are just very critical that you want your user's eye to immediately be drawn to? If that's the case, then I would give those a darker shade and I would I would maybe separate those colors into groups of five or groups of six and I would possibly highlight, you know, the top six of them as like a, a dark red or something and then have the other colors a more neutral color. Or I will simply use a, um, a filter, not a filter, a calculation that says if a particular error is selected, then highlight it else everything else should be um like a neutral color so i would allow the user to pick the error that they want to see and then have the error highlight that particular color i would never go the route of trying to display all 21 colors because the user is not able to tell the difference for all 21 colors so that is that one from mike hopefully i answered your question um another question the link for the john hopkins uh, related data, I would refer you actually to the Tableau website, which has the clean version. They're also pulling it from the John Hopkins one. So I would just refer you to Tableau's website or Tableau Public's website, and it has the uh, COVID-19 data hub there. And it, you select access data, it's going to take you directly to the clean version of that data. The deck for this um, is, it, it can be available. It's actually available now on the Tableau 2019 conference website. So um, I can share that link as well. And you can rewatch the presentation that I did at the conference, which was the same presentation from tonight. 
and below that they have a link for the deck. So the deck is out there on the web and I can re reshare that. I think those were all of the questions. Does anyone else have a question? This is Brian. Can you hear me? Okay. Yep, I can hear you. Okay. We, um, so this is Brian Loverman again with the Northern Virginia tug group. Um, I want to thank you Chantilly and Jessen for coming on and doing this presentation. You guys did a fabulous job and I know for one, I learned quite a bit tonight. And I definitely plan to go back and relook at everything that you ladies presented. Um, fantastic job. Um, for the people that are on the call, um, we'll get the link information to you. We're trying to set up a LinkedIn site. We're also looking to setting up a website for the group as well. And we're looking for future speakers for um, upcoming presentations. So if you or your company would like to get involved in that, please reach out to me. You can do that through replying to the um, splash invitations that you received. Um, and I apologize, didn't get a presentation slide for myself together, but you can also reach out to Brian B R I A N dot Liverman, L I V E R M O N, at VW.com. And that's my work email. Feel free to reach out there with any questions on the group. But I want to thank you, ladies, again. Uh, do you have anything else that you wanted to add before we close out for the night or any other questions you see pop up? I do not see any additional questions, uh, but I'll just echo Brian. Thank you so much for, for having us. And are there any, I don't know if anybody wants to raise their hand, if there's other folks on the line that want to do any announcements for um, other events that are going on that you want to share with the group or jobs or, or anything like that. So if you just want to raise your hand, Alyssa can unmute you. Hi, this is Sebastian. Can you hear me? Yes, Sebastian, go ahead. Thanks. Okay, perfect. Um, yeah, first of all, I was uh, looking forward to this um, event tonight with, sorry, with big anticipation, and uh, I wasn't disappointed. You know, definitely things, Chantilly and, and Jason, that was uh, quite impressive. You know, I've been following you uh, over the last couple of weeks and months. And I was looking at your skill set in terms of data visualization, and um, it's really building up. So <laughs> that was a great performance. Really appreciate it. Um, for those who still know me um, from the first presentation a couple of weeks ago, when we had our initial kickoff of the Tableau user group at the Audi of America um, headquarters, uh, you, you probably remember I was particularly speaking about the roles that we're looking for in order to staff the team. And um, in the context of the last couple of weeks, how things have developed, um, we put the brakes a little bit on, but um, here's the good news. Uh, so over the next couple of weeks, we are going to release those roles that we earlier uh, promoted. So look out for those on the Audi career site. Um, you can find that easily through Google or, um, you know, just uh, get in touch with me or follow me on LinkedIn. I'm going to publish those positions there as well. So anyone who's interested still or has peaked new interest of working with Audi within the data space, specifically working with Tableau, uh, working with data on a large scale, you know, including vehicles, customer data, and you know, operations in general, um, that is to be coming over the next couple of weeks. So definitely looking forward if that piqued your interest. And again, thanks for the session today. Very well organized, Brian as well. And we're looking forward then to the next session in a few weeks. Thank you, Sebastian. I appreciate it and uh, always enjoy working with you. So thank you. Um, any other folks that have uh, any announcements or comments they want to make before we sign off? Uh, Brian, I'll add that and I just placed within the chat the link to the to the slide deck and the link to des um, design secrets for a non-designer for them to download the requirements document that I displayed earlier. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, I saw that. Uh, thanks, Ch Chantilly. Um, I think uh, quick, one quick question, uh, Chantilly, before you, uh, before, I guess, before we, we wrap, up, wrap up this uh, thing. Um, I know you mentioned about sheets and uh, dashboards and, uh, and other color uh, schemes and uh, designs. How about um, story? Um, I know you haven't touched on story. And personally, I haven't seen much of story design in that, you know, in Tableau, the workbooks. So is, 
Is that have you have ex any ex experience, you know, working on the story design or or just because it's there doesn't mean you should pay too much attention to it? Are you talking about the the story uh, selector? You know, there's a workshop dashboard and then story. So typically a story is going to follow the same pattern as a dashboard. So a story can consist of either one dashboard or one worksheet within a story point, right? And if you think about designing your dashboard and your worksheet to the same secrets that I just presented on, then your story is already gonna follow that same flow. And if you're incorporating a lot of dashboards into your story, then you wanna make sure that they're following the same theme and layout and whatnot. So I would just think of your, your story points as a combination of a lot of dashboards that should all follow the same theme. Typically your workbook in general should follow the same theme. So as long as you're doing that, then no matter what you add to your story point, you'll be fine. Okay, got it. Thank you. No problem. We have another hand that's raised from uh, Randall Hill. Hi, this is Randy Hill. How are you? Good job tonight, by the way. <clears throat> My question is, um, is this, uh, unless I missed it, did you uh, discuss anything about Tableau Server? Did you get into that at any point? I was following along, but I I heard you know worksheets and and workbooks, but I didn't hear anything about server. Is that so something you, you talk about uh, in another event, or or what can you tell me about that? So in terms of, of server and design, the only thing that I can touch on about that is just making sure that you're testing. So if you're adding visual elements to your dashboard, you always wanna make sure that you test exactly how it displays on the server. So there may be times where you're using a particular font that isn't compatible with Tableau server, and you wanna test that to make sure that when you publish it, the end result of what the font is that's going to display. Also, if you are working with like custom fonts and you're working with an on-prem Tableau server, um, or your own Tableau server that's in the cloud, then essentially you can upload that font to the server and it will then allow your dashboards to, to have the compatible fonts between desktop and server. So that's pretty much all I talked about uh, in terms of uh, desktop and server. It was mostly about design, but you definitely wanna test out anything that you design on desktop before and after you publish it to server. Okay, all right, great, thank you. No problem. everybody I appreciate it um, I really appreciate it. again the presentations they're wonderful um, thank you Alyssa for your help on getting this going as well um, if anybody has any follow-up questions after this feel free to reach out to any of us in regards to it again this is Brian Liverman I'm uh, one of the main leaders for the Nova Tug group uh, reach me again at brian.liverman at vw.com but thank you all for attending please stay safe out there and we'll be able to do one of these in person soon again, but if not, we'll look forward to doing another virtual one. If there's nothing else, I will uh, say good night to everybody and thank you again. I appreciate it. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.